There were experiences with the Lord in which the awe of God and the fear of God were revealed. How many times in the Bible do you see angels show up and the very first thing they say is, do not fear? It's because God is so awesome and so incredible. And it's often this moment in your life where God will transform you. It's how he takes Saul of Tarsus and creates the Apostle Paul. It's a moment of life transformation that you can't, uh, you cannot, you, you might, I'm saying you cannot, it's not worth it, you cannot give your no to. One of the reasons that people say no when this moment of visitation comes, the reason that the angel says do not fear is because fear is present is because he is so awesome that there's a fear that comes in, but what happens is people get confused about that and they say, I'm feeling something negative. This can't be from God. And yet that's a lie from the enemy. People have walked into services, they've even walked into our church and they said, that's, it's too much. The, the, the presence of God, the charismatic, it's too much. When the truth is, <laughs> Do not fear. It is God. Put your uncomfortable soul aside and get ready to give your yes to God. Sometimes we have to experience encounters that are beyond our control so that we can let go of control. We all need an awe of God experience. If it's in your heart right now to manifest the fullness of the purposes of God in your life, you, you need an encounter like this. You need a Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul moment, a moment in which God is so tangible and so real. I think there's moments where people thought they might die because, because God was so real and so tangible. The Apostle John, writing the book of Revelation, fell down as if he was dead. He gets this invitation to come up here and I'll show you the things that are to come. And he falls down as if he's dead. Prepare your hearts in such a way that you're ready to give your yes when the moment of visitation comes. So many times God has caught me by surprise where I've gone to luncheons and specific meetings and there's been so much God purpose that I haven't, I, I wasn't fully aware moving in. And there was this split second where I was put in a position where I heard the voice of God say, this is a Kairos moment, but you have to make a decision. Are you going to bail and say no? Are you going to close your heart? Or is your heart ready to give your yes and be empowered in that moment? Look, this is an incredible season right now in the history of the earth and the history of the church. And we need to live in such a way like the 10 virgins that we've, we've got the oil, that, that we're prepared and we're ready to give our yes, that we're ready to be sent as soon as the word is said, that we're ready to engage and be prepared. I've had an incredible month and a half from the moment of Jim coming our apostolic oversight and my pastor and speaking into the, this fellowship and the things he brought that equipped us for living in this season to a conference that I attended a week before vacation to the past three weeks I've met with various leaders in the city that have run in this city for decades because I felt it was the timing of God to say, Adam, start to glean on what they know, start to glean on what God has spoke to them to our city. What have they seen as opposition? What have they seen as opportunities? What have they seen as the spiritual climate of our city? Kingston is, is so unique. It's so unique that we've got education from uh, the military college to Queens to St. Lawrence. We've got uh, politics in our city. We were the first capital of, of Canada and, and parliament. The first prime minister lived lived here in our city, there are so many influences in our city. For being only 133,000 people, this, is, this, this city is very important. 
and there's something happening because the timing of all these things is, is happening and it's accelerating and we have to live in such a manner where we're ready for that visitation, where we're ready when God does anything, says anything. He's working in you right now to will and to do according to his good purpose. And all he needs is a yes. All he needs is a willing heart to take a plumber by the name of Smith Wigglesworth and create an Apostle Paul, create a minister that would impact the earth and who years after his passing, people would still be reading his material and looking at his testimonies. When David faced Goliath and he said, this day the world will know. One stone, one stone spread the message of God throughout the whole earth. He said, today the world will know that there is a God in Israel. <laughs> That's incredible. One act, one moment in time, five minutes maybe, five minutes to run at him, throw the stone, and then cut his head off. And the whole world would know that there is a God in Israel. I'm, I'm ready for that. I am ready for those moments. I am ready to engage in this season in the earth right now in that kind of way. I'm ready. Whew. Yeah. Praise God. You know, we, we took full advantage of, if you were here three, two weeks ago, if you are here two weeks ago and you heard Stephen, uh, Pastor Stephen Beck uh, preach uh, that, that was a Kairos moment, at least in my mind. And as, uh, with the role that I play in the church, with the, with the role that I hold in the church, I don't know if you noticed, but I attempted to take advantage of that moment and squeeze every ounce of what God had for us in that moment out. I took the gift of God that Stephen is and, and his history and what God's done in his life and I honored as best as I could with the introduction and afterwards, but I saw it as a moment that a, an evangelist, the heart of an evangelist was expressed in our church, was expressed in this house, and I wanted to honor that so that we could have the reward of that person. And I grabbed the moment, the Kairos moment, and I put out an invitation for those that felt the same to stand and engage and I feel like we honored God in that moment. I feel like we engaged as we needed to. I felt like we, we took advantage of the Kairos moment. We gave God our yes, and I believe there have been deposits that have been made in this house and in our lives. I, you can't see me at the front, but I pretty much cried through that whole message. That whole message. We've talked about the hardness of heart a strategy of the enemy to do that right now to you in this season, to create offense, some sort of hardening of your heart so that you wouldn't be sensitive to the moment of visitation, to the time when God says, now I'm at work in you. Right now I'm releasing something. Right now there is a gift that you can pick up. There is something that you can grab right now that will stoke the fire in your life. Is your yes there? Is there hesitation? Is it, is it a maybe? Is it a, is it a no, this is too scary, right? The, the angel appeared, the presence of God is thick. I'm scared. It doesn't feel right. I want to run the other way. Do not fear. Do not fear. The fear of the Lord, if you live in the fear of the Lord, you won't fear anything else. There's no other fear that, that'll be able to touch your life if you fear the Lord. And that fear is a holy reverence. It's not a terror of God because Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I don't learn from people that I'm terrified of. But I learn from those that I, I, oh, I really learn from those that I revere and respect and honor. I understand their role, I understand their authority, and I want to glean, I want to hear every word that they speak. That's how much I, I fear them and, and revere them, the fear of the Lord. Hmm, that's good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You know, I, I felt the Lord 
um, share with me a couple days ago. He gave me this picture of somebody climbing a, climbing a ladder, but it was a, it was a rope ladder. And if you've ever tried to climb a rope ladder, they're, uh, they're not easy. They're very unstable. And I felt what the Lord was saying, and if this is a word for you, you can grab it. I actually pictured somebody over on this side of the church. Um, but what I pictured was that, that you're giving your yes to God, and, and you're climbing up the rungs, but there's some instability, maybe not in your life, but in the structure of, of, of what it is that you're trying to climb. And I believe the Lord is going to bring stability to something in your life. There's something in your life that is going to stabilize right now, right now, right now. It's going to stabilize, and it's going to give you a footing to step forward into your purposes. The picture I saw was this person climbing this rung was frustrated that they weren't higher than they were. They were frustrated that they couldn't climb this with ease. They were frustrated about how difficult it was. It doesn't have to be difficult with God. God's bringing a stability. It says, do not give the devil a foothold, and with ladders, your foot needs to be held. God is bringing a stability for your foot to hold. It'll be on a firm foundation, and you'll continue moving in the purposes of God for your life and increasing in those. As I was driving here today, <laughs> as I was driving here today, I saw a squirrel run across a hydro line above the road. And you know, God will speak to you through the most incredible things. And, and this picture of creation of the squirrel running across this, this wire you know, you look at it and you think, well, that's amazing that they can do that. How do they not fall on my car? How do they not fall on the road? How do they not fall from whatever 20 plus feet in the air? And yet I felt the Lord speak immediately. And so I, I knew it was a word from the Lord. And, and if this is for you, then grab it. But I felt the Lord say, look, look, the road may look narrow and it may look unstable, but you can trust him. He's the one that holds you. In fact, he holds all things together. And he's holding your life and he's holding you. And you're looking at this, what looks like a tightrope, and you're thinking, God, I can't step out on that. It, it doesn't feel stable enough, but he's saying, that's the path, that's the way. And you can do it, and I'm going to hold you every step of the way. It's too narrow, God. No, it's not. It's not. You're fully equipped with the presence of God to step into his purposes. It looks narrow, but that's how he's going to get the glory. It looks narrow, but that's going to build incredible faith in your life, in what God can do, that he's faithful and true. You'll have a manifestation of that name of God built in the fabric of your being because you'll see the miracle of him helping you through the narrow way. Okay, praise God. Would you turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm 23? Most of you probably have committed this to memory. I've chewed up a lot of time with a spontaneous intro. We will make it through. <laughs> he is with us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Psalm 23, I should probably go there myself. I'm just going to read the first four verses. It really is my heart to see you equipped. Like I said earlier, there's something in my heart and my spirit that just feels the anticipation of what's happening in heaven and the visuals of what's happening on earth and know that God is responding. Know that God is responding. And know that there is a floodgate of response that's going to be on a world scale that's, that's right upon us. And right now, we have to engage in God in a manner that we believe that, that there is faith that that is what's happening so that when the floodgates open, we're a part of it. We're fully engaged and prepared. 
season of preparation. Here we go. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Those first three verses, they're beautiful. They're comforting. We love them. And then all of a sudden, verse 4 comes into play. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God wants to prepare us as people to be able to walk into any and every circumstance and not fear. If you've seen any resemblance of evil in the wor world today, David came to a place where it said he feared no evil. No evil. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be the evil, the, whatever the evil is, discouragement, uh, oppression, uh, depression, whatever, whatever it is that you see, we can live in a place where we fear no evil. Now, if I said, could you testify today that you've walked through a situation in which you would consider being the valley of the shadow of death, you'd respond and say, yeah, I've, I've been through something like that. And I, I love the terminology because there's three words that David uses. He uses the word valley. We don't usually respond to valleys very well, at least that term. A valley maybe representing a low place. And then he talks about a shadow, something that has darkness, where there seems to be a lack of light. And then he talks about death, the very opposite of life. Now, look, this is so important for today because it's not just us walking through, which, by the way, is a very good idea. If you find yourself in the valley of the shadow of death, don't stay, go through. Go through. It doesn't say, I, I, I camped in the valley of the shadow of death or I sat down. It says, even though I walk through, I may have said, even though I run through the valley of the shadow of death. But these are David's words. The valley of the shadow of death, this is so important because, because often we'll feel like we're walking through a valley of the shadow of death, but there's a lot of valleys, there's a lot of shadows, and there's a lot of death going on out there. And for us to reach what's going on out there means that we're going to have to step into what's going on out there, but we're going to have to be the mountain, we're going to have to be the light, and we're going to have to be the life. And we're going to have to position ourselves like David to step into a place where it says, I fear no evil. Now, why did David fear no evil? It was because he built up his faith so strong. It's because he was so self-disciplined. He says, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Because you are with me. From beginning to end, the Bible is about relationship with God. And relationship with God functions better when the person you're in relationship with, you're in the presence of. My, re my relationship with Candace is so much better when we're sitting in the same room together. Communication's a lot easier. I can read body language. We can uh, be close to each other. The presence of God is so vital that we be carriers. The whole point of the Old Testament temple is being mobile tabernacles, that we now are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that we would carry the presence of God everywhere we go. And David's awareness of the presence of God is why he feared no evil, for you are with me. It's that awe moment. It's living a lifestyle of experience in which those awe moments happen so that you know he is with me. I'm not going to fear anything because I've tasted of this, because I've seen the God of love, joy, and peace, because I've seen the power of God expressed in my life. Look, I'm going to give you something that is so weighty in revelation, you're going to want to write it down. I'll get a little closer. Fear 
is not good. Fear is not your portion. For God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. As I meditated on that verse this morning, I thought, what does the world need more right now than the power of God, the love of God, and a sound mind? That trio is a powerhouse right now. We cannot be a church that carries a spirit of fear. We need to be a church that carries the spirit of power, of love, and of the sound mind that God has given us. If you experience fear, it's not your portion. It's not what God gave you. He gave you power, love, and a sound mind. He didn't give you fear. Fear is a foreign entity, and it's not your portion. It should feel foreign when you feel fear. It shouldn't feel normal. It, it's not some place that you sit down and, and make home. Faith is that place. David declares that he will not fear, for God is with him. The presence of God is the remedy, the antidote, and the solution for fear. You say, well, uh, the Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear. And that's true, but God is love. See, we can't take love and make it a separate entity away from God. God is love. And His perfect love comes with His presence. It doesn't come apart from the person. It's not something you can go and buy at the store. I, I, I need this entity called love. No, it's part of the person. It's, it's part of the presence of God. It comes as a, as a package. See, the reason we still feel fear in the valley is because we aren't aware of His presence. We aren't aware of His presence. Look, Psalm 25 says this. This is so good. Verse 15, David says this, My eyes are ever on the Lord. My eyes are ever on the Lord. It's the only thing he looks at. It's almost like he had an encounter with the fiery eyes of God, and now he can't look away. He has this encounter as if it's the only thing. He, God, is the only thing worth looking at. And that's the truth. It says, my eyes are ever on the Lord. <laughs> Ooh, there's a goal. My eyes are ever on the Lord. I can't look away. He's too beautiful. He's all I want to look at. He's all, he's all I, I need to look at. Here's what the rest of the verse says. For only he will release my feet from the snare. Only he will release my feet from the snare. God is your deliverer today. God is your deliverer. Do you need an awe encounter with God? Absolutely. We need to live a lifestyle of encounter in which, like Brother Lawrence, we practice his presence everywhere we go, all the time. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's not just an outpour night. It's not just a Sunday morning. It's a lifestyle of living in the presence of God. The reason we still feel fear in the valley is because we aren't aware of his presence and also, sometimes we're more aware of the problem than the God who holds the solution. Sometimes our faith in the strength of the valley is greater than our faith in the presence of God. You know, Daniel 9, I believe it is, says those that know their God will be strong and do exploits. Those that know their God, the presence of God, those that know God will be strong and do great exploits. There's a key for how to move and operate in this season that we live. Sometimes our faith in the problem to harm us is greater than our faith in our God to help us. The initial reaction when you see fear shouldn't be, oh no, what's going to happen to me? It should be, thank you, Jesus, that I will fear no evil, no evil. 
the enemy cannot have a foothold in my life and try to intimidate me with problems or situations or things going on in the earth today, in my life or in anybody else's life. I will fear no evil. You know that old saying, don't tell, yeah, I did know it. <laughs> There's just a, a delay. Loading. Don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big your God is. Who helped me out with that? Cheryl? Thank you. God bless you. Favor and blessing. Are we doing okay? Okay. Look, we're, we're not alone. Peter had the exact same challenge. Peter steps out on the wind and waves. He steps out on the boat. His gaze is on Jesus, and he says, if it's you, tell me to come. Jesus says, come. So Peter steps out. He's looking at Jesus. He's walking on water. This is incredible. This is awesome what's happening. What, a, what an incredible experience that Peter's having in this moment. And then what does he do? He looks at something else. He looks at the wind and the waves, and he says, wow, those waves look big. That wind's blowing my hair around. Wow, that's, that's terrifying. And as soon as he takes his eyes off of Jesus, he begins to sink. David says, Psalm 25, 50, my eyes are ever on you. You know, there is no need to ever take your eyes off of Jesus. There really isn't. There is no need to ever look at any circumstance or situation, you can keep your gaze solely fixed on him. When he kept his eyes on Jesus, he lived above the storm. He lived above the trial, the place that we've been called to live. The storm had no effect on him, and the valley doesn't have to have an effect on you. Peter's awareness of the presence of Jesus made all the difference. Be gracious with me. Let me just get a couple more points in. In Job, your favorite book, in Job chapter 3, right at the very beginning when all this calamity happens, when everything comes upon Job, he says this right at the end of chapter 3. It's very interesting. He says, the thing that I feared has come upon me. That's very powerful. Because there's something to be said for where you fix your gaze and for where you look, for the experience that you're feeling. Job looked, obviously, he looked at what was happening and there was fear. And the fear of this happening in the future, before it all happened, obviously gripped his life and it caught his attention. I remember Pastor Bill saying, whatever competes for your attention is going to compete for your affection can't allow what we see because the eyes are the window to the soul. We can't allow what we see to let fear into our core, into our lives. We can't allow what we see, let the fear come into our soul. Do you know, fear and faith operate exactly the same way. They both look to future events. And so fear, you could stand here and say, like Job, I'm scared about what might happen. I watched the news last night, and I'm scared about this happening. And all of a sudden, we've opened this door for fear to possibly come in because of where we fixed our attention. And because we've put our attention on it, it's now vying for our affection. When David said, my eyes <laughs> are ever on you. But faith stands here and says, hey, my portion isn't that what I see on the TV. My portion is the promises of God, what I read in here. My portion in faith is not believing in the negative, but the positive. It's not believing in the faith. It's, it's not having faith in the problem, but it's having faith in God. It's not believing in the strength of the valley. It's believing in the, <laughs> in the strength and power of Almighty God. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things 
are possible. Let's see with the eyes of faith and not with the eyes of fear. This statement of Job that says, the thing that I feared has come upon me is directly opposed to David's statement of I will fear no evil. It's directly opposed. It's the direct opposite. There's a comparison here. There's a parallel, and you can choose You can choose your future. You can decide your future right now. You can decide what happens tomorrow, what happens this afternoon. You can decide that by allowing fear from what you see in the valley, from the shadow, the death, or by saying like David, he is with me. What do I have to fear? The one that's conquered all, the creator of the universe is with me. He'll never leave me and never forsake, never forsake me. But what happens in the valley is that our attention is drawn away from my eyes ever being on him. And we start to see other things. And then fear tries to creep in. Here's a statement. This one's worthy of writing down. God's presence is the same in the valley as it is on the mountain. It doesn't matter what your experience is. Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is unchanging, and he will never leave you and never forsake you. So why do you have a different experience in the valley? Because the valley caught your attention. And now your awareness of the problem is greater than your awareness of the God that has the solution. In his presence is the fullness of joy in his presence. You can read all the verses about joy that you want, but this book points to a person. This book invites us into relationship with presence, with the person of Jesus, and in his presence is the fullness of joy. We can feel the same love, joy, and peace in the valley as we do on the mountain. How many of you have had mountaintop experiences? You've been somewhere, there have been Kairos moments, you know that God has met you, it's been a mount of transfiguration, you've tasted and seen that He is good. That's your home, that's where you're called to live, no matter whether you're in the valley or you're on the mountain. You're always on the mountain, even when you're in the valley, because you've been seated with Him in heavenly places. This is the way we need to live today. This is a message for right now. This is important. Because we need to be mountaintop livers. We, we need to live in this fashion out there in the valley, in the shadow, and in the death. This is what God has called us to, and this is what he's equipping us for. And I know that sitting in front of me is that group of people, is that body. There are more than enough people sitting here right now to transform our city. I know it. I know it. If one man, David, could take out Goliath and the world heard about it. It transformed the destiny of Israel to take out Goliath, the stumbling block. Then there's more than enough people here to see Kingston hear the gospel and be saved. If I nod my head, will you nod your head too? (laughs) Can you give me an amen? amen? Yes, let it be so. I agree. Let it be so. Absolutely. Thank you, Jesus. The rest can wait for part two another time. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me today? God is equipping us to live here and now. David served the purposes of God in his generation, and then he fell asleep. You won't fall asleep until you've served the purposes of God in your generation. That means if you're alive right now, if you can hear me, which I hope you all can, (laughs) you're all taking in breath, then you're part of this generation and you're part of what God's doing. And God's simply asking you for a yes. Will you be the mountain, the light and the life in the valley and the shadow and the death? Absolutely. Will you position your heart right now to say, I will fear no evil? Why? Because I know the presence of God, because I'm familiar with it, because I live in it. And the effect of the presence of God in my life causes me to fear no evil. No evil. 
no nation, no army, no military, no world leader, no political system, no political party, no political leader. I will fear no evil. There is no evil in operation in the world today that we have to fear. Because last I checked, he's still the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And there is nobody that can remove him from that throne. It's not about numbers. God always worked with the remnant. He shrunk armies from 32,000 to 300 and still fulfilled his purposes in the earth. Don't look around and think that we're ill-equipped or ill-numbered. There are more that are going to join our numbers. But it, to fulfill the purposes of God in the earth, it only takes a few. There's enough people right here. Do you have faith? Do you have faith to believe that? Can a nation be saved in a day? I believe it too. I believe the whole earth is going to gaze upon his beauty and see him. Yeah. Ooh. What a day that'll be. Ooh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh. We've got to live in the awareness of the presence of God. Yeah. Whatever comes against your awareness of that presence needs to bow its knee today. Yes. It needs to bow its knee. Whatever hinders or makes that presence of God dwain in your life, it needs to bow its knee. You and God are the majority today. Our first response, whenever there's a problem, whenever there's a valley, whenever there's a trial or a challenge, is to be aware of his presence, yes. is to lean into faith and not fear, is to know that there is a solution and there is an overcomer. There is a God that is the Alpha and Omega and he's working all things for good. Do not start exercising the vain imaginations about what evil might occur. Paul said to take those vain imaginations and take them captive. He actually uses that word, take those imaginations, those thoughts captive. Don't fall into what Job did and fear things coming upon you. Move with faith and know that your portion is the favor and blessing of God, is of increase, it's of being fruitful and multiplying. That's what he has yes. called for his people. That is our portion. So Father, we join hearts together in unity and we commit as a body to step into this future of the church and this future of the earth to express your glory, to be carriers of your presence. Let that presence and the awareness of your presence grow. Let it grow yeah. more and more and more, our awareness of your presence, that we see you in everything, that we see you in squirrels running across uh, hydro lines. God, that, that we see you in all your creation, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And all the people, it says, all the people that live in it are the Lord's. Let us be aware of your presence in everything and what you're doing in everything. Let us see what it is the Father is doing and do that. Let us hear what it is the Father is, is speaking and, and let us do that, God. We commit our way to that. And right now, Father, if this is for you, I just want you to, to get ready to receive. Just open your heart, open your, your soul, your spirit. Get ready to receive right now. We just rebuke and come against the spirit of fear. The enemy's tactic in the earth right now through media, through many avenues, is fear. And we rebuke fear right now in Jesus' name because fear is not our portion. But right now, I just pray, God, for a baptism of the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. I pray for a baptism of that spirit for your people right now, a baptism of power, a baptism of love, and a baptism of self, of a sound mind, of self-discipline, some say. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for equipping your people. Thank you for your spirit that equips us, for your presence that is with us. 
thank you, Lord. We bless you, and we love you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Amen. We will have a ministry team over here to my left. If you would like somebody to pray with you, please take advantage of that. We love ministry. Uh, there will be a song, Stay, Enjoy the Presence of God, Fellowship, Minister to Each Other, Be the Church. I commission you today from 12 o'clock today to go out and be the church until 10 a.m. next Sunday. You can still be the church here, but I commission you to go out into the highways and the byways, to go out into our city and to be the mountain, to be the light, and to be the life in our city to everybody you meet. May you be ever aware of the presence of God this week and in a manner that you've never even felt before. May you feel equipped and see things you've never seen before, see things over people and in people. May you speak words of wisdom and words of knowledge and prophetic words to your family members and your coworkers. May you go in the power of the Spirit and destroy the works of the enemy like Jesus called us to. Let there be light over this city. The light of God shine through this city and dispel all the darkness. May the life of God be released over all the death in the city. And may the mountain of the Lord be established in this city. And we'll worship him in this city. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.